George R. R. Martin uses his blog for a number of things. If you're unfamiliar with it, he tends to post just general uh, thinkings, musings, in addition to discussing what he's been up to lately and talking about books, both his own, books he's edited, and A Song of Ice and Fire on occasion, though that has been infrequent over the past 11 or so years since Dance came out. On December 23rd of 2022, Martin posted a really interesting blog post, the likes of which we really haven't seen before. That being a post going specifically into detail about one location in A Song of Ice and Fire. That being Casterly Rock. This post reveals a lot of interesting information and could uh, lead to speculation regarding the rock's importance in uh, A Song of Ice and Fire going forward in The Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring specifically. So today we're going to go over exactly what was stated in this blog post, as well as what it might mean for the future of the series as a whole. This post is entitled A Couple of Rocks. It begins discussing the seat of House Lannister, Casterly Rock, and its role in the series so far. Most notably that it has been mentioned uh, many, many times in A Song of Ice and Fire, and has even been kind of flashed back to by Tyrion, by Jaime, and by Cersei. However, it's never actually been seen on page in A Song of Ice and Fire. Martin has expressed his desire, both in the past and it was reaffirmed in this post, to go to Casterly Rock at some point in the future of the main series. However, this has not occurred as of yet. The entire, uh, essentially, purpose of this post seems to be to clarify certain elements about the Rock for the purpose of the story in the future. Martin goes on to specify at length the exact uh, appearance of Castle Rock and what shape the castle actually takes. This seems to be kind of a deviation from the show, and that seems to be Martin's main concern in posting this. He knows that everybody saw the show and saw that, oh, Castle Rock just seems like some other castle that's on top of a mountain here. However, we see from this image from the World Book and from George R. R. Martin's description here that the castle is built into the rock itself. We can compare these two images side by side and see that they are quite different. In the uh, image from the show, it is just a pretty standard castle on top of a rock, whereas in the book, it seems to be very much the mountain itself is this castle, which does seem to be a sizable difference and would be quite important if this castle were ever under siege. Martin then goes on to discuss the details in the illustration, as well as the actual specifications of the castle in the text itself. Quote, Ted got all of the little details right. The great stone stairway on the south face, in the shadow, leading up the rock's main entrance. The sea gates at the base, large enough for galleys and cogs to sail into the caverns under the stone, where the Lannisters have their own protected docks. The two rocky protrusions jutting out into the sea on either side of the caves looked at from the south. They evoke lion's paws, and the rock itself resembles a crouching lion, one of the inspirations for the heraldic imagery of the Lannisters and the Casterlies before them. There's also a watchtower on top of the rock. If you look very closely, here and there, scattered up and down the face of the mountain, you can see windows and arrow slits. They seem small, but that is part of the illusion. The rock itself is very large, massive. Martin also goes on to specify that that single watchtower atop the rock is just a tower essentially for maesters to house their ravens, as they can't really send them off well from inside the cave, which does make a lot of sense and kind of lends credence to why they would have this single solitary tower on top of the mountain. Martin then goes on to detail his inspiration for this landmark, that being the Rock of Gibraltar. However, he discusses how this is kind of turned up to 11 in a bit of a Spinal Tap reference, which is a very good movie. Uh, but he, in a lot of his world building, has a tendency to make things a lot bigger than their real life counterparts, and this seems to be no exception. The Casterly Rock is much more massive than the already massive uh, Rock of Gibraltar, which is a pretty big landmark, uh, and especially given the fact that this is a large world already, it is much bigger than things like the Wall, or even perhaps the uh, ta Old Town Lighthouse Tower there. He then goes on to specify why the rock is so great in a siege. Quote, That's what makes the rock the strongest and most impregnable seat in all of Westeros. The Eyrie, Winterfell, Storm's End, they all have formidable defenses, but none of them can match Cashfully Rock. When Heron the Black built Hall, he thought that this immense new castle could defy even dragons. Stone does not burn, he reasoned, but stone does melt and dragons fly. And well, you know the rest. Balerion's flames proved hot enough to turn Heron's massive towers molten. The Casterly Rock is in a mountain, and its chambers and halls are buried deep inside, under tons of solid stone. 
No certain wall in Westeros, however thick, can even come close. This is a really interesting specification for our author to make, and I think that it does really inform what might end up happening in The Winds of Winter, as the entire purpose of this blog post seems to be to preemptively explain the actions of characters that they're going to take in The Winds of Winter that might not make sense to us if we just think of Casterly Rock as the way it was portrayed in the show. And now we're going to get into some speculation as to what exactly those actions might be in The Winds of Winter. We see in Season 7 of the Game of Thrones show that Daenerys Targaryen conquers Casterly Rock. It seems like she might focus on it in her invasion in the books as well. However, differences would very much be present as there are many deviations between the show and the book. More likely, the book is going to follow a more logical course than that which is seen in the show. However, I think that this entire post is indicating that Tyrion's knowledge of the rock will lead him to suggest to Daenerys that, hey, you can't uh, claim this place with dragons. It's not going to melt. They're not going to do anything in Castle Rock. However, there are other approaches that we could take in order to take this castle. Martin has made it clear several times that he hopes to see Castle Rock in the Winds of Winter or in A Dream of Spring. We don't know what point of view character that might be, but it does seem unlikely that it is any of the Lannisters. They have their own things going on at the moment, and none of them can particularly claim Casterly Rock and all of its lands and titles that come with it. However, there are two other characters who I think seem quite likely to view the Rock. Those two characters being Victarion Greyjoy and Barristan Selmy. Where we leave off in A Dance with Dragons, both Victarion Greyjoy and Barristan Selmy are hoping to serve Daenerys as best they can. The reason I am mentioning both of them is I think only one of them will see it, but I also think only one of them will survive the Battle of Fire. I think it's more likely to be Victarion than Barristan, but it could realistically be either of them. Specifically, this description of Martin's focuses a lot on the sea and the naval aspects of Casterly Rock. This seems to indicate that perhaps he wants to detail the surrounding docks and environment for a naval invasion, as it would be much better to have this knowledge out in the world beforehand, rather than having this kind of misconception from the show allowed to stand uh, and just kind of allow people to think of it as a, a goof up in the book itself once it eventually comes out, if it comes out. Should he survive the Battle of Fire, Victarion seems like a likely candidate to lead Daenerys' navy. This makes sense, as he's a Greyjoy and has been a captain his entire life. And if this is his job, it would also make sense to sail around the bottom of Westeros, perhaps uh, bolster his forces in the Iron Islands, and then go and attempt to lay claim to uh, Lannisport and to Casterly Rock. This could be a great arc for Victarion, as he very much could redeem himself from the burning of his fleet in Lannisport, which was happened during uh, the rebellion by Balon Greyjoy, as he burned a bunch of ships with Euron there uh, back during that rebe rebellion, but that rebellion was unsuccessful. This could be his chance to redeem that memory and actually successfully rebel at Casterly Rock. It's also worth mentioning that Tyrion could be with him for this, both her advisors to Daenerys, and given Tyrion's status as the uh, janitor of Casterly Rock in his youth, he likely has great knowledge of the sewer systems in Casterly Rock and would be able to guide an invasion of it. Jaime could also plausibly end up at Castle Rock should he survive his confrontation with Lady Stoneheart, mostly because he's not too far away from it. He's currently in the Riverlands, which is directly adjacent to the Westerlands, so it is conceivable that his journey could take him back to where he came from. So, this has been the video detailing Martin's new information on Casterly Rock. I will link to the article in the description. Let me know what you think of it. Let me know what you think of my theory. I'd love to hear it in the comments below. I'd also really appreciate it if you leave a like and subscribe to all that YouTube stuff. It really helps me grow the channel, and it just makes me feel good in general. So, it, I just really appreciate it. Thank you all for watching. I hope you had a happy holiday season, and I should have more videos coming for you in the near future. Have a good one.